here. All right. Cooperative Legacy Project Interview number 14, August 4th, 2005. We're visiting with J.D. Lind, former Executive Director of the South Dakota Association of Cooperatives and a member of the South Dakota Co-op Hall of Fame. J.D., where, where and when were you born? Oh. <laughs> oh we're going way back. Way back, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was born in Ellis, Kansas, and... Uh, July 27th of 1933. Okay. Where, what part of Kansas is that in for those well, of us who don't? Uh, that's kind of in the west central Okay. part of Kansas. Okay. And where was your family originally from uh, before Kansas? Well, uh, my uh, actually, they, uh, my parents were originated in Kansas. Uh -huh. uh, my dad's parents uh, came over from Ireland. Okay. And uh, they were uh, Irish uh, uh, background. Uh, my mother uh, was English, uh, and she was born and raised in the southeast part of Kansas. Okay. Uh, do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah, there was 11 of us. 11? Wow. Yeah, and uh, uh, two, uh, two of them died at infants, but there was nine of us uh, raised. There was mm -hmm. uh, four boys and five girls, mm -hmm. and uh, there's still uh, seven of us. Okay. Are they kind of scattered around? They're scattered. Uh, most of them actually uh, is... There's three of them in Kansas, uh, one in uh, Colorado, mm -hmm. and uh, four, I guess, four in Kansas, and one in uh, Arkansas, mm -hmm. and then I'm up here. You're the only one who went north. Yeah, I'm the only one who went north. Okay. Uh, were you were you raised on a farm? Yes. Okay. What are, what are some of your earliest memories from the farm Well, back in the 30s? Yeah, we... Uh, well, I I remember as just a little kid. Of course, I was born in '33, and must have been. I can remember like almost in '35, '36, and one mm -hmm. of the memories I remember of my mother uh, wringing out sheets and hanging them up to the window to catch the dust uh, that was coming in. And I used to stand at the window and watch for my dad, who was hauling. We we had a big cattle ranch. And uh, uh, my dad was hauling uh, hay from, actually from my mother's folks down in southeast part of Kansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, the, the truck would get within probably 100 yards of the house before you could see the headlights. The dust was so bad uh, most of the time. But I, I know I used to know that he would be about there, or mother would say something, and... And as just a little kid, I used to stand and watch for the truck lights to mm -hmm. come through there. Well, that would have been that about was, the... That's some of my early recollections. Yeah, that would have been about the heart of the Dust Bowl down there, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was. And we, uh, you know, up here, some of them say, well, we used to get that red dust from Kansas, but the red dust come from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... We used to have the red dust roll into Kansas, it, it, but it, it come out of Oklahoma. Okay. What was your dad's name, uh, first name? Miles. Miles. Okay. What, was, what sort of person was he? You want to talk about him a little bit? Well, uh, he was uh, the youngest of uh, three brothers, and uh, his... His dad died uh, when he was about 14. And uh, uh, his dad had a lot, of, I guess he was close, uh, close to his dad. His dad was pretty close to him. And, and he kind of told uh, uh, my dad, uh, uh, you, you have to be responsible, you know, for mm -hmm. take the brothers and go ahead. And, and, they did. The three brothers then left home there, and they went west about, oh, it's only 
probably 25, 30 miles. And uh, uh, leased a bunch of ground there. And they broke out a thousand acres with horses. And uh, see, they run about 2,200 acres of grass and a thousand acres uh, of uh, cropland, which was uh, primarily winter wheat. And uh, all summer followed in that country. And, uh, and then they raised uh, a little uh, cane for winter feed, but a good share of our, uh, our livestock, we run, uh, Dad and his uh, two brothers, they run about a thousand head of cows. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they run on pastures. Uh, we had about three miles of the Saline River run through our property and a lot of spring cricks that fed into the Saline River. And uh, so it was ideal cattle country, and uh, mm -hmm. the river breaks there give, uh, was good protection. But uh, primarily, my dad used to calculate his wheat crop based on the tons of beef he could take off of it. So we, mm -hmm. uh, we grazed a lot of winter wheat. Yeah. And because okay. uh, that was uh, good sheep feed and good cattle gain on it, and we could run down there. We could put cattle on there. They used to plant earlier before they got into the Haitian fly and some of those things and had to wait later. But we used to uh, put cattle in there first of October, and sometimes uh, they could graze till almost the middle of February. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you could get uh, take a lot of tons of beef off of uh, off yeah. of the wheat. We also, even after, I, I remember as a boy, we, uh, we had three combines, and uh, we would uh, combine a lot of wheat, but we always thrashed a lot of wheat. And we had one of the few thrashing machines in the uh, area around mm -hmm. there. And my brother and a hired man, usually we hired two or three hired men for the summer, come out of Missouri. And... Uh, my brother and a hired man would go around not only buying wheat that we wanted to thrash, but also for uh, quite a range of neighbors around there. And then we usually had uh, two or three hired men around to help shock that wheat and stuff. And then we would, uh, we would combine quite a bit of our wheat, but then that that we thrashed was where we was going to winter cattle and uh, dad liked the straw piles for those cattle to to graze that winter wheat and then run to those straw piles and they'd eat a lot of grain and straw in those but uh but it was good winter protection too for them mm -hmm. they'd get behind those straw piles and, yeah yeah and probably got better into the 40s than as far as oh yeah yeah but uh we uh we would we would thrash there and then uh, my dad i would we i'd help as a kid on the weekends but then when we had to go to school uh he was thrashing clear up into the de early december for neighbors around there mm-hmm okay uh what about your mom a lot of work out there with that many kids there I was imagine. a lot of work out there uh uh mom uh, come up from around Emporia, Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, to some neighbors up there, and was working as a hired girl up there as a fairly young age. And I think her and my dad uh, got married just ahead of harvest one year, and so her honeymoon was uh, primarily. Uh, cooking for a crew of about 15 harvest hands uh, out of a cook shack. Mm -hmm. Dad had uh, what we would call a camper today. Uh, it was an old cook shack on steel wheels that they pulled around with the harvest crew and uh, kind of a wood stove and a makeshift uh, kitchen. And uh, so she uh, she started right away cooking for uh, a large <laughs> harvest crew. Uh, when you were young, what did you want to do? You had a big family. You you may you may have figured maybe you weren't going to uh, 
all be able to be farming that same ground. That was, I was one, I was, of course, uh, I was the youngest boy. Uh, and I think that was probably early on, um, you know, I probably pretty much figured out I couldn't stay, you know, on mm -hmm. the farm. And so, consequently, uh, uh, I was kind of pointed into some kind of agribusiness as, uh, mm -hmm. as, as I was uh, going through school. And, uh, but, you know, my, my oldest brother uh, went to, uh, was in World War II. And uh, then my next brother went in. He was killed in Germany in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, then I and the brother just older than me uh, uh, never went in to the service. Uh, but my oldest brother, when he come back, he went to work for an implement business. And uh, Dad had a... a uh, tractor loader accident and fell uh, quite a distance he was in the loader and kind of broke crushed his heels and, and his ankles and uh, they told him he'd never walk again well out of sheer grit he got up and walked the rest of his life but the farm thing didn't uh, didn't look like it was going to work for him him and my oldest brother then bought out a case implement dealership Okay. in Smith Center, Kansas, and uh, they uh, they run that until uh, later. My uh, my older brother uh, went into the insurance business, and Dad sold the implement dealership uh, when he was ready to retire. Mm -hmm. So, um, school? Did you go to a country school, or was I went? Uh, we rode. I rode horseback four miles to school for eight years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And well, then we went to uh, we went to high school at uh, Trigo County High School, which was one of the few schools in that time that organized as a county unit when it was organized originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were seventeen miles from town, but what they did, they paid us mileage to drive back and forth uh, to school. And there was I and, and about uh, and my brother and about three cousins that carpooled back and forth. And uh, then when the weather got really bad, why we did have alternatives, uh, places to stay in, in town. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's where we went to school. <laughs> But uh, baseball was one of my real loves, but uh, it was not in the cards to play uh, uh, baseball or track because uh, at that time of year we was calving heavy. And Dad wanted us at, uh, as soon as we got out of school, we was home and on horseback and riding mm -hmm. cattle. Did they have Legion team there? Uh, they had Legion teams. Uh, but there again, it was pretty tough for us being that far from yeah. town yeah. to, uh, to take off in the summertime to, uh, mm -hmm. now we used to play some baseball in pastures, uh, on the Sunday afternoon, uh, in the neighborhood around there, mm -hmm. but, uh, it just didn't lend itself to, to participate. I played football and basketball in the wintertime, okay. you know, but, uh, the spring sports was a little little out of reach for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember you once told me about the technique for catfish uh, catching. <laughs> what was it, noodling or something? Uh, <laughs> did you do that down there in that river? <laughs> well, we used to uh, we used to go up and down the river. We used to take a, a car seal beam mm -hmm. and a couple of these old batteries out of the, the country telephones which was pretty powerful batteries and, and made a made a pretty good light taking old seal beam out of the car and uh, we would take pitchforks and walk the Saline river mm -hmm. and uh, you could uh, you could stab those fish as they got into yeah they'd go at night 
at night they would move from one deep hole to another and sometimes they was only in six or eight inches of water mm. and when you uh, you had that you know get them in that shallow water you could you could catch them and uh, so we used to yeah I and my brothers used to do that quite a little bit and we used to we used to catch some quite a few carp mm -hmm. and uh, that was all sand bottom and the carp was uh, was pretty good my mother used to fix the carp like you did salmon in a pressure cooker oh. and then you could just you know you could eat the bones and all they were just soft and and so she used to fix carp in a pressure cooker and hmm. we ate quite a few carp that <laughs> way too well you got a big family you don't get you know you i'm today you know people ask me do you uh, do you like this or do you like that and I haven't ever found anything I didn't like you mm -hmm. know there's a few things I like better than others but uh, yeah. as a kid growing up you just ate whatever was on the table you didn't ever ask uh, yeah. for any special favors yeah I it's hard to think what a, what a mother would have said out on the farm if you'd asked that. <laughs> something special cooked oh, for yeah. you instead yeah, of what everybody she else was cooking eating cooking for all those kids and then sometime four or five hired men besides yeah you know. yeah yeah uh did you go to college i went to uh, uh <laughs> it was kind of a struggle i went to manhattan uh for a semester uh k-state and then my sister was in in emporia she was a teacher down there and my brother-in-law was a army recruiter and he was being transferred to Germany. So uh, he called me up and said, if you'll come down here and stay with Viv, uh, you'll have free board and room. And uh, then he was going to Germany. And then in the spring, I was to drive them back to New York. And uh, they was, mm -hmm. was going to join him. So I did that. I went to Emporia State then for... Uh, for that semester second semester mm -hmm. and uh, then I I went to Fort Hayes State when I got home that spring I had a good job down down at Emporia and they begged me to come back there but when I got home I had started uh, doing front-end alignment in my dad's shop and uh, we built quite a little business that summer uh, there. So when it come fall, Dad didn't want me to go back to Emporia State. He wanted me to stick around, but he said you could go to Hayes, Fort Hayes State. So I went down to Fort Hayes State, then come home every weekend, and Dad would have about 20, 25 cars lined up for me to line up over the weekend. <laughs> so I would come home on Friday night and work till uh, uh, late Sunday night, and then get up early and it was close enough uh fort hayes was close enough i could drive back to fort hayes state the next morning mm -hmm. but uh after a year down there uh they uh we was i was right up next in line on the draft for the uh korean conflict and so uh I didn't go back to school the next fall because they said you'll be in the next month's call. Well, as it turned out, uh, they uh, they would have enough volunteers to fill their quota each month, and so I kind of was around there for the all winter, actually working for my dad there in the shop because uh, help was awful hard to find during that period. So many people gone to service and stuff, and so. Uh, so I stayed around there, and I guess the next spring, then I got married, mm -hmm. uh, and then they was actually going to draft me then, and I went down to meet the bus, and she had the note there that they had quit, quit taking anybody that was married. So I never, I wound up, I never did go to the <laughs> service. But what was that, that about 1953 or two? Or yeah, like that? about 52, three. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 51. So, yeah. So this would have been about 53, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you got married then in 52 or three? 52. 52. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you've got uh, you've got kids. So 
How many of them? We have four children mm -hmm. and eight grandchildren. Okay. Uh, and their my oldest boy uh, is in California. Mm -hmm. He's got two girls. Uh, he's uh, he went into the service as a pilot, and then uh, after thirteen years as a full time uh, military pilot, he he went on reserve status and uh, went to work for Delta Airlines. Mm. And he has flown for Delta for about 15 years. And he just retired from Delta. Uh, he's still in the reserves, but he'll have 30 years in next June. And he'll, he'll have to retire then next June. He's full colonel. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, so he's, uh, he's working for a small town out there, an airport, uh, that he's doing some consulting work now for, and then then in the military. But okay, uh, Connie is a speech therapist. She's got uh, two children, and uh, she lives in Denver. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Dennis uh, lives here in town, works Northwest Public Service, and uh, uh, they've got two two children. And then uh, Darren, my youngest, is in Des Moines, Iowa, and mm -hmm. they've got uh, two two children. They're the youngest of our grandkids. They're uh, eleven, ten, and eleven. So. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get around to cooperative stuff. Were your family members of cooperatives down when you were on the ranch or farm down there? Yeah, in, in fact, Kansas? in fact, my dad uh, spent a lot of time organizing cooperatives. I can remember as a kid. Uh, you know, going with him to various meetings, trying to put cooperatives together, and uh, wake up on the couch when it was time to go home, uh, somebody's home someplace. Uh, but I, I made a lot of trips with my dad when he was uh, working on that. They, uh, the first, first one I remember was a grain elevator in o Ogala, Kansas. And, uh, they had, there was a private elevator there, and so they decided uh, to try and start a elevator. They pooled enough money that they bought a rail loader, something to unload from wagons and, and uh, trucks, and load into boxcars. And that's all they had the first year, and they decided to price the grain just like the the private elevator was doing it and but by the end of the year they had enough money to to build their elevator uh just that one season they almost paid for a grain elevator just with uh, the margins that they was taken and then later of course they they built an oil company and, and stuff mm -hmm. so yeah i uh and then Later on, of course, he was involved with telephone and electric and this sort of thing, too. So, yeah, I was exposed to quite a little of that as a youngster. Mm -hmm. what, did, uh, what in particular did uh, your dad and you like about cooperatives at that time? Well, of course, uh, uh, the main thing was, was getting a margin for, yeah. for your grain. Uh, we just... We just uh, you couldn't get a price, uh, and so uh, I remember a little later on when we was I was involved with uh, when Farmland Industries built the first fertilizer plant in Lawrence, Kansas, and uh, I that was almost uh, let's see I it would it cost them that first plant cost like fifteen or seventeen million dollars I believe. Mm -hmm. And everyone thought that was a, a horrible thing. But we was paying $150 a ton for anhydrous ammonia. And uh, when they built that plant, anhydrous ammonia dropped to $130 a ton. So it dropped $20 a ton immediately, you see. But they paid for that $7 million, $17 million plant in three years. So... Which was, you know, there again was a strong demonstration of what uh, competition mm -hmm. in the marketplace uh, 
yeah. meant. Yeah. And later, you know, anhydrous ammonia got down to like eighty dollars a ton. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there when uh, after they got the plant rolling and things and saw where they was at. So, so it a big impact. You know, taking the price of fertilizer from one hundred and fifty dollars a ton down to eighty dollars a ton was uh, a lot of money in a lot of farmers' pockets. You uh, got into cooperative management. How did that come about? Well, I was, uh, I tried a number of things and I was selling insurance and uh, they was looking for, uh, and I was down in uh, more in uh, the south central uh, part of Kansas working down there for a while. But then my home was up in the north, north part of Kansas and The Osborne County Co-op was looking for someone to do PR work and uh, doing and retail sales. So I come up and interviewed for that job and went to work for the Osborne County Co-op. Or yeah, and uh, and then we had twelve branches. Mm -hmm. So I wrote their newsletter. I uh, did uh, the youth education programs. Uh, I did. uh, a bunch of that stuff, but I also sold feed. I was a feed salesman, and I hit Osborne. Well, they was expanding because they had just built the Kerwin Dam and the. Uh, hmm. Well, there's the North and the South Fork of the Solomon river down there and they built a dam on each one of them and irrigated below them and that was all right in our territory Mm -hmm. so the first thing we i did was involved with was going around and doing survey work with our membership uh to find out what their potential was well the first thing we decided we was going from dry land wheat to irrigated corn Mm-hmm. And so that meant uh, a lot of livestock feeding. So we built a big new feed mill to service actually 12 branches around there. Uh, and uh, so then after we built the plant, then it was my job also and uh, to go around and work with the, the feeders to, uh, to help them develop their programs. And... Uh, the another thing we got involved with there was uh, we had traditional banks at that time that was in the habit uh, say Joe out there would feed uh, 25 head of steers this year and if he didn't come out uh if he didn't come out too good you know then they would uh, the banker would say well I don't think you ought to feed over 15 this year see and, uh, and the other thing, of course, when they went in to, uh, to do their, their loans, uh, they would say, well, you know, you, uh, you can just charge your feed down at uh, the co-op, see. Well, uh, they'd tie up all the assets, and we'd be sitting there with feed bills, see. So we developed a program uh, with the PCAs at that time uh, to to finance them, and these guys uh, was uh, was pretty good because they would go in and say, "Okay, you've got uh, this labor, you've got this amount of feed. Uh, it takes this amount of money to feed your family, so you ought to be feeding 150 head of steers, mm-hmm. you see, instead of 25 or 50." And so they was encouraging the guys to put a program together that uh, would feed their family. Uh, The banks at that time wanted to hold them down to where they had uh, 10 times the assets uh, tied up as to what uh, the loans were, (laughs) see. So when we put that program together with the PCAs, we said, okay, we're not going to shut out the banks. So I made a tour of six banks in our territory and offered this program, mm-hmm. and each one of them turned me down. But I got back and made my report to the management there that night, and uh, 
The next morning, when we went to work, we had six bankers on our doorstep saying, we got to thinking about that. We don't think we want you to send all your business to PCA. <laughs> so we did develop a program with that. But that was the healthiest thing we did for the farmers in our territory was suddenly they started loaning on uh, ability and management rather than just an asset base. Yeah. And uh, it was a, a big boon to the economy in, in those two irrigated valleys in particular uh, that we... And then after we got into it a while, because we would... The guys would, we put up, a, a, had a guy in our office that was a credit specialist. And the guys would come in and he'd, he'd help the guys put together a budget, you know. And then we would set up a commitment, a loan commitment. And then we actually would guarantee those, but the bank would, would hand them, see. Mm -hmm. And it, later on, then we had banks come in and say, well, you don't need to go through that. We'll will handle it. We said, fine, you know, as long as you include the fertilizer and the fuel and the feed and everything in that budget to where we know it's going to be taken care of, then, you know, we don't want to be in the banking business. We just mm -hmm. want to, we just want to do business. And so then we did, did actually train a bunch of bankers and, and did uh, wind up with a pretty healthy uh, situation down there. Mm-hmm. But that was, I think, was a real, some real milestones mm -hmm. uh, in that area. And, and due to the, the farm credit system and uh, their philosophy, and then we was able to extend that and, and uh, bring it to a wider, broader. Mm -hmm. Was that kind of picked up by some of the other areas around Kansas? Yeah, there was uh, a number of areas then around Kansas. That picked. We had uh, the uh, uh, Bloit County Co-op, which was next door uh, to us to the east, and they mm -hmm. had they had about the same size. They was had ten, twelve branches, and and they also adopted a very similar program. Went with, and it kind of permeated around there then it just the word got out you know mm -hmm. and uh, of course and then the farmers would go to various meetings and this sort of thing and say well this is what we're doing well then they start putting pressure on either their bankers or their co-ops in their areas mm -hmm. uh to make some changes and and that yeah that kind of permeated out around then okay uh, during that time, what what you, would you say as you look back now? What was the most important thing you learned during that period of, with uh, the Osborne County Co-op? Well, we went through a lot of uh, transitions there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and one of the things I learned, I think, because we kind of got ourselves in a little bit of a bind because we was a fairly healthy co-op. Mm -hmm. But as we developed into the irrigation program, uh, we started building, had to build fertilizer plants, you see, because uh, fertilizer wasn't a big issue and, yeah. uh, and dry land wheat. Uh, but when we, uh, we moved that, well, the board would say, okay, let's, uh, it'll cost, uh, say, 25000 to put up a fertilizer plant in our Alton branch. Mm -hmm. Well, so they would just they just pay for it. Okay, so we had twenty five thousand. But what happened? We put up like six branches, like that. But then you had fertilizer applicators, you had nurse tanks, you had inventory, and you had counts receivable. So that twenty five thousand would bloom bloom into maybe three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. you see by the time well then you multiply that by six and the first thing you know we had ourselves spread pretty thin so we had to go out with with membership meetings and i found out i think one of the biggest lessons is go out to your membership lay it on the line and say here's uh, here's the situation and here's some ways we think we can we can straighten it out because we had always been paying a lot of cash dividends mm -hmm. see 
And so the question became, okay, do you want to continue this cash discounts or do you want to start uh, paying off the debt and build equity to provide you with more services? Well, when you laid everything down on the line and the guy says, hey, in order to make my operation work, we need these services. So our challenge then is to get this thing uh, put put on a perspective where we can get it paid for and we can continue to grow and develop uh, more facilities to, to provide me with the service I need. And I, I think that was one of the big lessons I learned. If mm-hmm. you just... You go to the membership, you lay it on the line and say, here's, here's what it is. Uh, because uh, we, you know, we went through a big accounts receivable crunch, too, because we had gone through a time when you paid the accounts receivable was paid every six months or once a year. You know, mm-hmm. well, when you got to doing the volumes that we was doing, uh, there was not margin to carry that kind of accounts receivable. And so then we had to go, we had to switch members uh, to a strict 30-day credit policy from uh, a wide open situation. And, but when you laid it on the line, uh, these guys come in and said, hey, we recognize this is what has to be done. And so uh, we was about half scared to go to the country with, with that kind of a program. But uh, when it was all said and done and you laid everything on the line, that uh, if, if you're up front and honest with the guys, uh, you can get an awful lot accomplished. And uh, Sooner or later, that's an issue that kind of confronts almost every co-op if it's sure. going to grow at all. Yeah. Um, comes up to 1964, and uh, how, how did it come about that you ended up going to work for the Kansas uh, Cooperative Council? Well, I was on the Kansas Co-op Council board, mm-hmm. and uh, Hal Halibus was the executive secretary at that time, and his board, uh, you know, wanted to expand and put, uh, put another man on, because... Uh, he was tied up with a lot of things and a lot of projects, and he needed somebody to do the field work and and this sort of thing and work with the youth programs and, and manage your director training. And so uh, when they was, he called me one day, you know, and started talking about this position. And uh, so I... Uh, you know, I thought he was searching for somebody, you know, and I guess I give him a few suggestions, and he said, no, he said, I want you to come interview. <laughs> and I hadn't really given that yeah. part of thought to time, but I thought about it a while, and uh, so uh, there really was an interview. He'd already made up his mind. There really wasn't an interview. He just says, uh, I'd like for you to go to work next next month or well in about two weeks and I said well I've got a lot of things hanging fire I'd like to spend uh, at least a month and get these guys uh, mm-hmm. transitioned and he said I'll if you'll come down and work the state fair in Kansas in two weeks then you can go back and do whatever you need to <laughs> so that's what I did I worked for him uh, I went down and started with the Kansas State Fair we had a big uh, co-op uh, building down there, which we had all the de- various co-ops. Uh, mm-hmm. and it was all in the same building. And so I spent the 10 days down at the Kansas Fair and then went back uh, for a couple of weeks and finished up with uh, them before I we moved. I moved then down to towards, well, I moved a little town close to Topeka. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and went went to work for him then. Okay, now Topeka was where the office was. The office was in Topeka, mm-hmm. so it was kind of like I say it was kind of on the east side of the state. So when you went West River to Garden City or Ulysses or Liberal or mm-hmm. you know, uh, you was uh, you had to spend two or three days out there in order to justify it, and that's I, a lot of times I didn't go. I was twenty miles uh, west. Of, Topeka at St. Mary's 
And so I didn't always go in the office. I spent a lot of time on the road working with the membership. And mm-hmm. maybe I was in the office maybe one or two days a week. Okay. And uh, okay. the rest of the time I was on the road pretty much. All right. What do you have you doing out there? Well, uh, primarily it was... Uh, we had, uh, of course, we was building membership, mm-hmm. number one. So it was it was a membership thing. Uh, I worked with the VOAG departments across state because we had uh, a co-op training deal with all of the VOAG mm-hmm. departments in the state. So I, I spent quite a little time working with them and uh, with the membership. And uh, then, uh, then I put on... Uh, I worked uh, with the college, and we put on manager director training programs. At at the time, they uh, the directors hadn't been exposed to hardly any any uh, formal training mm-hmm. as board members, and so uh, we put on a lot of a lot of training programs across the state. And so I was involved in that. We also had uh, one of the other guys in the office. Uh, who wrote our newsletter and and kind of did some research and this sort of thing and uh, he uh, he would work with me on a lot of the workshops too. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but that that's primarily what we was doing. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a chance to work with some interesting people down there during that time? Oh yeah, yeah. I had uh, we had a regional co-op uh, uh, or you know fieldman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked with a lot of those. I worked with the farm credit system uh, mm-hmm. there. The regional people, the farm credit system, and uh, the bank uh, for co-ops. And uh, then we had uh, we had a group uh, co-op auditing firm that was separate uh, from from the regionals. And uh, I worked close with a lot of those uh, people. And uh, and in the college, uh, mm-hmm. we was connected with the college, and I had several friends there that uh, was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And any of them that particularly stand out that uh, you want to mention by name? <laughs> you think back? Oh, one of the old pioneers, of course, that uh, he was always trying to get me to go to work for him was Guy Williams. Uh, uh, one of the original people with farmland industries at that time, mm-hmm. and uh, then there was a couple of couple of guys. Uh, I can't even recall their names right now. With uh, with the Grain Terminal Association in Kansas City, mm-hmm. that uh, I used to work with quite a little bit. Okay. Uh... 1968, uh, you get an offer up here in South Dakota. Uh, how did that come about? Well, uh, we had gone to a lot of, uh, we had annual uh, meetings with the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. And uh, then the state associations would get together during those. And I guess uh, during some of those, uh, the chairman of the board up here uh, at that time had uh, had been at some of these meetings and they were kind of in transition they had hired Jim Taylor right out of college to come manage the association mm-hmm. and uh, Jim I think did a good job for them and, and they was kind of trying to get organized and and get some things changed and he did the procedural things work close with the college and this sort of thing but they wanted to do some other things they wanted uh, uh, they wanted to make some changes and so they called me one day in in Kansas and and uh, asked me to come up here and interview mm-hmm. and I said, well, I'd think about it, but I didn't give it too much. I went into my boss and, and told him. Yeah, I said they'd already called him. and uh, But I said, man, I said, I've got a lot to learn. I don't, I don't not turn. Well, he said, it may be time for you to spread your wings a little and go up and talk to them. And 
and see what you think. And uh, so I did. I called him back and agreed to come up for an interview. Uh, and uh, that was like in November mm -hmm. sometime. And they, uh, so they, uh, they uh, hired me. I was to go to work the first of January. And uh, the interview was down to uh, I and Art Song. And uh, that wound up being a, a very good. See, Art was uh, manager of the co op at uh, Brookings. Okay. Uh, but Art had uh, been frustrated with his knowledge and the resources available for marketing, grain marketing. Mm -hmm. So he had gone back to college part-time and got a uh, his master's in, in grain marketing. Well, uh, I don't know. He's a very capable person. I don't know why they chose me over him or whatever. But they went with him. Well, he had he turned around then and went to work for the college. Mm -hmm. So consequently, he was my main resource in training programs uh, for the next several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of that's kind of how that developed. Uh, their rationale was they had looked at the Kansas program down there and kind of wanted to pattern something after it, and that was the reason that they'd call me. When they hired Jim, they sent him to Kansas, and he traveled with me for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, down there, kind of learning something about cooperatives. And he come from a cooperative family, but really hadn't had any specific formal training in that area. So, mm -hmm. But he traveled with me for a couple of weeks. So immediately when they called me to come up and go to work, I called Jim. Mm -hmm. You know, and said, hey, what's what's the story? Well, he said, they want to get some things done. They want to do some things differently. And he said, I just don't know how to take them there. Mm -hmm. And I think they wanted to get more involved in the legislative process and, and mm -hmm. uh, lobbying and this sort of thing. So, yeah. And that that was the switch they mm -hmm. were trying to make, and that's mm -hmm. so that's when I went to work for them. I uh, I drove to Sioux Falls on the first of January, and uh, got into the motel late. Met with Charlie Lawrence, who was chairman of the board at the time, mm -hmm. with the PCA down there, managed the PCA. And uh, so I met with Charlie for breakfast and, a, and about an hour of visit or so. And it was 20 below that night in mm. Sioux Falls, you know, and I was checking my sanity. A good initiation <laughs> to South Dakota, huh? So I, uh, I come on up here, spent the rest of the day in the office, the legislature was getting ready to start was starting the next day back in those days it was what every two years yet or was it no, the no, annual session they they was in annual sessions okay uh, so i uh, i picked up the things i thought i would need out of the office uh, and it was like nine o'clock that night before i headed for pier mm -hmm. uh, i'd spent Scrounge through the office all I could to try and learn as much as I could. <laughs> and so I, uh, I went to Pier. Well, by the time it was 20, 25 below that night, and by the time I got to the Blunt Hill, I was getting some gas line freeze up, and I was doing about 25 mile an hour the time I uh, topped the Blunt Hill. I finally coaxed it on into pier, went down to the some station and got some gas, you know, some uh, heat, put a couple of cans of heat in there, and then drove around for another 20, 30 minutes to get that cleared up, and uh, which which I did, and then 
and then checked into the motel. And, mm-hmm. It's a and, shame they didn't have ethanol back yeah, in those days. <laughs> yeah, that's because because as soon as they come out with ethanol, I've burned nothing in any of my vehicles yeah. ever since. You know, yeah. and uh, so never have bought another can of heat mm-hmm. after I started using ethanol. Mm-hmm. But uh, but that was uh, that was kind of a scary experience uh, that uh, that night. Uh, and then so then I started up on the legislature uh, the next day and uh, didn't know a soul, mm-hmm. just come up from Kansas. And so I took some advice from an old friend of mine in Kansas. Uh, he, uh, he said, when you're in a position like that, J.D., just walk around with a smile on your face. You'll make everybody else nervous because they'll wonder what you're up to. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of faked it that first session, I think, by uh, just walking around with, uh, with a smile on my face and trying to watch for, for the... But I had had, uh, I had, had quite a little cooperative... Uh, I had four years of cooperative... Uh, lobbying experience in Kansas oh, okay. before I come up here. Okay. I, Like I said, I was on the road, but during the legislative session, uh, I, I and Hal was worked the legislative session quite a little bit with to him. Mm-hmm. And Hal, uh, Hal was come out of the uh, North Dakota Farmers Union program. Oh, okay. And... Uh, uh, so Hal had always been involved in a, quite a little mm-hmm. bit of the lobbying activity, and yeah. So, um, yeah. so he was he was a good mentor, mm-hmm. you know, when I uh, worked for him down there. Yeah. And so, but then, then I I started uh, that, and uh, so I think that first year. A lobbying. Uh, I I tried to kind of sit back and watch and and see what was going on. And one of the things I noticed, of course, was uh, we was trying to they was trying to take sales tax off ag chemicals. Mm-hmm. You know, and they had done this was about the third or fourth year they'd done that. Never got it out of committee. Yeah. And. The ag group groups all wanted to do that, but everybody was doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. And I think I recognized as an outsider, yeah. uh, you know, and it, I had no more talent than anybody else, but I think coming in as an outsider and observing, I could see what was kind of happening. And that's when I called the six of the organization, the Farm Bureau, the Farmers Union, Stock Growers, the Fertilizer Association, uh, the Rural Electric Association, my organization. Mm-hmm. I think that was probably the core group that I started yeah. with and called them all and said, uh, I'd like to like to get together and have a meeting. Mm-hmm. And that's when I said, I think we're confusing legislators by being scattered on specific issues. And that's when we organized the Ag Unity Group. Mm-hmm. Have they had anything and like that in Kansas? Have you had any experience? We, with trying to we get really, together? we had uh, a very informal mm-hmm. kind of deal we tried to get together. Uh, and with some success. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, it was it was pretty loose, and there was really nobody kind of in charge yeah. and to coordinate it. And so it was you'd get together and do some things, but uh, but Kansas hadn't at that point mm-hmm. really. Later they did, but this was something that I just I don't know kind of jumped out at me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we agreed to get together and work on specific things that we all agreed on mm-hmm. and that's where the Russian veto came from and the whole ball of wax because we knew that we couldn't beat up on each other mm-hmm. that wasn't going to work you know so we we thought hey we think we can agree on an awful lot of things mm-hmm. and let's not worry about the things we disagree on let's yeah. let's concentrate on these things so 
the first year, quite frankly, uh, we got together in my room uh, the first day of the session. Was that at the old Holiday Inn? Yep. Yep. And uh, I had a copy of the Farmers Union bill from the year before and a copy of the stock grower or farm bureau. I can't remember mm-hmm. who, who wrote the other bill. But I said, I don't care whether we have this bill or we have this bill or we sit down and write one. Mm-hmm. But I'd like for all of us to sponsor the same bill. And so we agreed at that time to do it. We went to the legislative research and uh, got the bill drafted. And uh, at that time, you didn't have Senate bills and House bills. Hmm. Well, actually you did, but you had sponsors from both groups on the same bill, you know. it would be introduced as a Senate bill, but then you wouldn't you wouldn't go introduce a House bill. See, you'd have cross sponsorships at that time. Mm-hmm. So we went up there and uh, divided it up, went in to get sponsors, and we shut it off because uh, and went and had it introduced because we had already had over a majority mm-hmm. of the House members. Uh, as sponsors on the bill. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, that was a bill, that was a good, what I mean, that was the demonstration for the group because here was bills that they hadn't been able to get out of committee four years running. Mm -hmm. And in two weeks, we passed both houses and had it laying on the governor's desk. And actually, uh, that bill meant nearly $40 million to farmers that first year. Later on, uh, that figure would have, would have ballooned to $200 million, mm-hmm. you know, when the use of fertilizer and chemicals uh, expanded. Yep. So, but anyway, that was, that was really the glue that, that put that organization together. And I guess I spent... 30 years as, as chairman, secretary, and treasurer <laughs> over the group. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But my board, uh, and it was, it was a credit to my board because they said, whatever's good for farmers is good for cooperatives. Mm-hmm. And J.D., you spend as much time on that organization as necessary. So... If we, if they had had kind of a selfish approach, you know, uh, we, I don't think that would have, you know, it would have worked. Uh, but mm-hmm. as it turned out, I think for the ag community, as I, because I tried to research that a little later years, but the ag community had about a 30, 35% batting average in the legislature. And with that group organized, it moved to about an 85%. Mm-hmm. Was it a little so, easier back then, maybe more rural legislators oh, than there are today? No question about it. No question about it. And and as the years, the later years that I was there lobbying, you could see the squeeze kind of coming down because yeah. of the ratios that uh, were changing. Yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. But the main thing... The main thing, uh, the biggest thing for legislators, and we didn't realize what a position we was putting them in, because uh, when we two or three organizations would put bills in, a legislator would say, do I vote for his bill and make him mad at me, Mm -hmm. or do I vote for his bill and make him? We was putting them in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. And and that was one of our problems and Mm -hmm. of course when you you solidified and they found out that all the groups and when you had a a good good solid uh, uh, rural constituency Mm -hmm. uh, when they found out all the ag groups sponsored this bill or was in support of this bill it wasn't hard so hard for them to make up a decision which way to go 
And I would expect there were there were other tax issues, certainly property tax related issues. Uh, um, I, having been out there some myself, I know that uh, the, the question of uh, how to value ag land has been a long-standing issue. Uh, were you dealing with that back oh, in the early always, years? Oh, always, yes. Uh, and that was always, we wrote a number of uh, tax bills or, or helped guide and direct the, the tax bills uh, because uh, you know it, uh, and we we tried to get the factors in the distance to market, uh, land quality, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and and all of these factors to take into consideration on the tax issue, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, but it was hard to get over the hump because all the directors of equalization they just wanted to go to sales ratio and that's yeah. it. Yeah. You know. Why do you think that it has been so hard to do here? Because a lot of the surrounding states have gone to more of a. Uh... I I really don't know uh, why they just they just you know and everybody you pass the laws you everybody agree to it but when it mm -hmm. all come down, uh, I don't know whether they just didn't want to put the effort into you know. Mm -hmm. uh, analyze it the way the, it was required or not but it, you just it was a terrible it's been a terrible struggle trying to get them over that fact yep. and then the other thing we had trouble with is uh, of course they always it was in the law to do it to throw out the unusual sales mm -hmm. but man they wanted to cram those in there mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and it, it would distort the sales ratio even see sure. So, uh, and you then you had all of that urban development around Sioux Falls that was you know, and Rapid City and mm -hmm. and well every place that that was getting into those mixes and mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. causing that sales ratio thing to be totally, totally inequitable. Yeah. You know. Yeah. What were some of the other issues back there in the? Um uh, around 1970, 75, through there? Um. Well, there was, uh, you know, we went through fencing laws, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and of course there was a lot of, uh, the the short grass issue was always a big issue, yeah. and and involved the, the Ag Unity Group quite a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, of course, a, a personal baby of the stock growers, mm -hmm. you know, because of all the leased land in, in western South Dakota. Yeah. And and then we dealt a lot with uh, school and public lands mm -hmm. and worked close with them in developing uh, equitable and fair uh, treatment of, of those things. And, uh, and then worked with... A lot of those rural counties, they would come in in Western because of the amount of public lands mm -hmm. and their ability to tax, mm -hmm. you see. And we had to crank that into the lease agreements mm -hmm. in order for those some of those counties to survive out there, you know, because um, of that. The other thing is we prairie dogs was always a big issue with mm -hmm. us out there. Coyotes. Mm -hmm. uh, and predators was was a big issue, you know. Uh, the other thing that we dealt with, always dealt with, of course, was uh, the egg college uh, budget. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that was always uh, uh, one of our priorities was was yeah. working that. Then, of course, we went through. We built a new feed mill over to the college. Uh, we built the, the diagnostic lab and expanded it. And uh, then veterinary students was always a big issue because mm -hmm. we didn't have a veterinary college. Yep. We went through a survey uh, one time in a joint effort with Nebraska mm -hmm. to build a vet school, put a lot of time and money in. Harvey Woolman was involved in that pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we put two years of study and research into that project and uh, 
but always wound up uh, buying slots out of state uh, because it was so much uh, cheaper mm -hmm. to uh, to do that than uh, than to uh, uh, have your own college. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then later, uh, funding those vet students, uh, yeah. I had the uh, appropriations committee come to me and say, uh, okay, you guys are going to have to come up with your own funding source for, for this. Well, there was two things that had happened at that time. One, when they, we had taken, of course, the, the tax off chemicals, and your pour on wormers and this sort of thing were, mm -hmm. were insecticides and were exempt from the sales tax. Pharmaceuticals wasn't. Yeah. So when they come in with the injectable wormers, like the ivermectin and some of those, mm -hmm. uh, the state interpreted that then because they was registered, they was both registered as a pharmaceutical and as a pesticide. Mm -hmm. But state interpreted those as pharmaceuticals yeah. and they were one to charge sales tax on all the wormers. Well, that's when... I met with the revenue department and had a couple other Ag Unity guys with me and we convinced them to roll that back mm -hmm. and quit charging sales tax on it. But they said, we want a law to straighten that out mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, we won't, uh, won't be confused over. So I went with uh, Merck and Company, and we uh, finally come up with terminology. And the terminology was endo and ecto parasiticides. Mm -hmm. So whether you poured it on or injected them, it was going to be exempt. So we passed a law exempting the endo and ecto parasiticides. <laughs> <laughs> that was something to spell. On the first and, yeah, and this always brought a rouse among whenever I testified before a committee. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> sounds like something that might be invading from outer space. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so they uh, they they would get a big kick out of that. But anyway, we did put the law on the books. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't, but about two or three years later that they come to me and said, uh, and I think, I think we had like a three year window on that. And, uh, but then they come to, and said, you're gonna have to generate your own funds to uh, fund these vet students. Mm -hmm. And we also was need more money in the uh, diagnostic lab. Yeah. So uh, we got together as an ag unity group and said, you know, that that tax exemption on that's going to suicide, and the way they're looking for money, we're going to have a hard time keeping that. Mm -hmm. So before it expires, uh, maybe we should redirect those funds and isolate them for vet students mm -hmm. and and the diagnostic lab. So basically, that's what we did. Then uh, we uh, we took the exemption off, but we the money was isolated and put into the vet students, and uh, I think that was generating about five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and it cost about three hundred thousand or three hundred and forty thousand for the vet students a year, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the money went into the diagnostic lab. Yeah. And yeah. uh, so yeah. that was that was kind of an interesting. Mm -hmm. Over the years uh, here in South Dakota and elsewhere, there have been the occasional uh, negative legislation for cooperatives introduced. Did you have to deal with any of that? I know that uh, Ben the, used to say that that was one of the reasons in, why we needed ag unity. In the early days, uh, in the early days up there, because there was. Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. uh, among uh, legislators. Uh, you know, 
they looked at, at it as just a totally, totally exempt mm-hmm. from taxes and things like this. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand the the membership equity and the members paying the taxes on on mm-hmm. their the uh, dividends and stuff yeah. like. They didn't understand that at all. And in fact, you know, I had legislators just want to argue with you, and you had to prove to them mm-hmm. how we operated mm-hmm. and what it was. So I think the first three or four years I was out there, I spent a lot of time just flat on education and yes Mm -hmm. we had uh, we had an awful lot of uh, legislation introduced in those early years but a little later on down the road Mm -hmm. I think we got away from a lot of that. Did you get any of the uh, legislation to mandate uh, uh, cash returns to patrons? uh, There was early in the early years there was a number of those yeah there was a number of those and and, and those things are were were hard to because on the surface it makes mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. but you had to convince them that you've got members out here that maybe a new feed mill yeah. or a fertilizer plant was more important to this guy mm-hmm. than the dividends. Yeah, and so this guy chooses to leave his equity in mm-hmm. there to build services for him. Sure. And so you had to go through that educational scenario in order to uh, mm-hmm. to get some of those things straightened out. Did you get involved at all in the uh, the territorial issue for the rural electrics as to determining where the who was covering what as far as the private utilities yeah. and Yeah. Uh, we was we was involved in that. Uh, pretty heavily, of course, uh, and and of course, the rural electric was part of the Ag Unity Group, and mm-hmm. and so, uh, but we let them. They primarily took the lead in that sure. thing, but but we was abreast of it, and the individual uh, Ag Unity members was was involved in mm-hmm. lobbying that thing all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. And then, of course, we come to one of the uh, big issues of the 1970s and into the early 80s, and that's railroads. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about oh, that? Yeah. Because we, when I, when I uh, my first meeting I went to, I got to South Dakota at 4 o'clock on an afternoon, and we had a beef and boxcar forum in Salem, South Dakota that <laughs> night. I got home and went into a, a bed in Lee Swenson's basement at, uh, at 2 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we we got involved in that heavily, and uh, so uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that was was uh, Janklow's railroad guy, Myers. Yeah, Jim. Jim Myers. Yep. And so Jack and I went over there when this was coming coming up and he handed us a packet that thick and of course that had the bonding and and the uh, uh, surcharge on grain and everything to pay for this mm-hmm. this thing and so we looked at that and we said hey you know that's not going to sell in the country so we went went through really what the purchase of the railroad was, and I think we did uh, about a seven, eight, ten page deal, mm-hmm. and we printed up uh, tons of those, and then I think we held like twenty educational meetings across the state, mm-hmm. and. In every one of those meetings, the only problem, uh, well, the membership wanted to go, they was ready, everybody, uh, all the ag communities, and even mm-hmm. even uh, uh, we had the rural business community. I met with, with, and I used to travel around and meet with uh, Kiwanis clubs and Lions clubs and, mm-hmm. and explain this railroad thing. I, I don't know how many of those meetings I made. But I do know we had 20 meetings around over the state that was published, and then we pan, handed out our booklet and went mm-hmm. through the process. 
and and we actually was selling his his bonding and surcharge on this thing. But in every meeting, the guys would say, "Why don't they just put on a sales tax and pay for the thing?" Mm -hmm. You know, and we don't want to bond for twenty years. That just don't make sense to bond for twenty years. So. When we got through with our series of meeting, I went in to see the governor and said, you know, there's only one thing we run into, and we're behind you. We told you we was going to back your program, and we're still behind you. But I think there's something you ought to know. The country don't like bonding. They don't want to bond for it. They want to put on a half cent of sales tax or something and pay for it and get it over with in six months. So I said, but you check in the country, get your men, get the calling, find out on your own, which he did. Mm -hmm. And he found out just exactly what I told him. But at that time, of course, uh, Bill didn't like to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And he never he, did. <laughs> he, needed, he needed to have uh, somebody with broad shoulders to take the blunt. And, yep. and uh, so he grabbed... Uh, the deal I'd handed him on on uh, how to how to pay for it, and went up to the caucus, and he said, "Well, I still because I got this relayed back to me, but I still think my plan's the best to go." But the Ag Unity Group backed out from under me; they want to go with the sales tax, and, and so uh, I guess. We'll have to do it that way. And uh, that's the way he approached the caucus on the thing. And I said, well, I got broad shoulder. If he wants to blame me and <laughs> go that way, that's what the country wants. We'll just do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, they put a half cent of sales tax on for six months, generated enough money to pay for the railroad. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how we got in it. But... There was bumps along the way. See, he also he also wanted to put in about three or four state-owned terminals, and he wanted to buy boxcars, and, and uh, he wanted to get in the grain business as a state. Mm -hmm. And that's where we put our foot down and says, no way. Yeah. We've got adequate facilities out here to handle this thing. And we don't need the state in the grain business. Mm -hmm. And so we struck all that stuff out of his original bill that he, yeah. he put yeah. together. There was and, kind of a handicap for South Dakota co-ops, I'm sure, you know, when looking at uh, uh, other states that had better rail systems. And, you know, we had the anemic system that we had. Uh, well, we was just, uh, you know, see, when I first started up here we had there was 525 co uh, grain elevators mm -hmm. in the state mm -hmm. you see and it wasn't uh, i don't think we was three or four years into the program when art song used to tell the guys you know we're going to wind up with about 12 elevators in the state and you know mm -hmm. this was kind of a shock and uh, but we had green elevators doing one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of business a year, mm -hmm. and he used to tell them, "If you're not doing five million, you know, in five years, mm -hmm. you're not going to be in business." Yeah. yeah. And so this was kind of a a shock. And then the other thing is when you had all these rail these elevators on abandoned rails, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they were just. They're totally out of business and yeah. uh, so but we calculated uh, the grain that was going to move on the rail that would uh, would bring because of the freight difference would bring uh, 10 to 15 cents a bushel difference mm -hmm. that uh, that added into millions and millions and millions mm -hmm. of dollars yeah, better prices in Kansas oh. and Nebraska North Dakota yeah. Than here yeah. yeah because of the freight mm -hmm. handicap we had yeah. And so uh, that was a big milestone. The railroad was a big milestone. It was a big, uh, well, it was a year-long lobbying effort for mm -hmm. the Ag Unity Group. I yeah. know that. And and the, the, we had to, 
uh, we made a lot of changes. Uh, there was not, you know, that went a lot deeper than uh, than just buying the railroad because involved in that legislation was the criteria for returning right away. Mm -hmm. You see, because uh, there was an eff effort on like game fish and parks to have all the railroad right away transferred to them. Yeah. See, which then that that left farmers with public hunting areas right through the heart of their their property. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. so we had to make sure that we shut all those off, and if they had easements. You know, going through that those easements, that land, if they abandoned that railroad like they did, a lot of that stuff was abandoned then. But we had in legislation in place that would put that back to the adjacent landowners. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, of course, was we had grain elevators uh, on, on lease, you know, they was on leased yeah. land. So there was privately owned land uh, that the state was going to take over. So we had to make a provision for getting appraisals, putting a price on that land so that the grain elevators could own it. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't want uh, we didn't want the the trustees of the old Milwaukee yep. to say, okay, we're going to sell that. You know, and you're you've got a you've got uh, thirty days to move your grain elevator off of it. Mm -hmm. You see, and that's the position we was going to put people in. Yeah, and so all of those things had to be put into legislation for uh, with mm -hmm. a provision of how we dealt with those. So uh, that was uh, that was a well almost a two two year effort mm -hmm. actually. Uh, the last year we. Yeah. We lobbied it to get it through, but uh, but there was a year long uh, legal uh, investigation mm -hmm. into how to proceed, yeah. and of course, and we worked close with Carl Anderson, uh, well Cliff at the time, yeah, too, uh, in putting in place provisions where we wouldn't leave people in jeopardy, both farmers from the lease land mm -hmm. standpoint to the uh, air easement standpoint to to the own land that uh, our grain elevators was leasing space mm -hmm. on and so so all of those things uh, it it became uh, very important to the state yeah. and and i today that's probably one of the most important moves we ever made was yeah. to buy that railroad yeah and was it a hurdle getting some of the old conservative type folks in the legislature to get over oh, the idea of the state owning oh, state owning rail railroads lines? oh that was just a terrible hurdle to get over they just couldn't see that you know yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know uh they just and and at the time of course we said you know at some time, we can get an operator that wants to buy them. You know, we'd like the state mm -hmm. to get out of it, yeah. sell them. And, yeah. of course, uh, basically, that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we finally arrived at that, that yep. place. Yep. What about the urban legislators? Were they uh, a problematic? Uh, did they see uh, the value to the railroads the way that uh, some well, of the, the rural folks could if they uh, were? Not at first, but that was the reason that we fanned out mm -hmm. and we did all the meetings with uh, the service, service clubs that we yeah. could get into. Yeah. Chambers and service clubs, we got into all of them, and we had figures put together mm -hmm. on the, the economy. Yeah. And, you know, if you as a businessman, say, in Groton, South Dakota, mm -hmm. and you could convince him that uh, 200 million bushels of grain was going to sell for 10 cents a bushel more mm -hmm. because of the yeah. railroad. Uh, it didn't take him long mm -hmm. to put the cash uh, yep. uh, economy, what it was going to do to the, the community. Yeah. Was it a late night thing when they finally <coughs> voted on that? I've got some memory of uh, looking down on the floor of the, I think it was maybe the senator of the house and seeing a little railroad going around on somebody's desk. Yeah, it, I morning. think it was about two in the morning before we put that thing to bed. It was 
it was one of those things uh, we I in fact I'm not sure the clock wasn't covered and uh, we was going past the uh, the uh, session time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it finally finally was put together yeah you want to talk about another issue that I think was uh, got to be crucial in the uh, about the time the railroad was thing was coming on and that was getting uh, doing something to encourage ethanol production here in South Dakota yeah that was uh, that was a big push and of course to come up with the the money for incentive payments mm -hmm. and of course there was, you know, you had, uh, you was dealing with uh, major oil companies yeah. in, uh, on the tax issue. You was also dealing with the uh, uh, Department of Transportation mm -hmm. and uh, who were all opposed, of course, to that mm -hmm. thing from the, uh, you give a tax break on, yeah. the, on the road tax. You also and sat in as a representative of the co-ops in, in the Highway Users Association. They yes. had a little different. Some of those folks had a little different take on oh, it. Oh yes, all. yes. Highway Users, of course. You had all the contractors in yeah. there, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to lose the money, yeah. of course. And so uh, it took a very strong. Actually, it took a very strong ag unity. Uh, you know a total unified uh, voice from the ag community in order to get that accomplished because uh, yes there was opposition and there was opposition from uh, uh, a lot of the the urban community there was opposition from the the oil companies there was opposition from the contractors mm -hmm. and all you know pretty powerful uh, lobbying yeah. groups and uh, so Yes, there was a, a tremendous amount of effort had to go into that, mm -hmm. that program. It might have been a few of them that back in those days might have been surprised to see what's happened today if they could have oh, looked down the road yeah. to see the kind of development we yeah. ended up as a result of that. As a result of it, yeah. Which would have never happened without yep. those incentives yep. uh, to, to make it happen. Yeah, yep. Yep. no question about it. Um, over the years, you've had a chance to work with a lot of people. You want to talk about some of the folks you've worked with, uh, <laughs> individuals? Oh, uh, you know, both my, of the association and outside. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, it's been a, a tremendous experience for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had uh, legislators that uh, stand out in my mind mm -hmm. as just uh, extremely fine fellows and. And the number of people I work with in the Ag uh, Unity Group, uh, you know, Jack McCullough was uh, a close friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, a very opinionated fella, uh, but a very intelligent person. Uh, didn't always agree with him, but you had to respect him for uh, mm -hmm. for what he uh, he brought to the table, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Sometimes uh, you felt like he was off the wall, but he did some things in the, in the Ag Unity Committee to make people think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it maybe stirred their ire a little bit once in a while, but at least he brought a discussion and, and you know. Mm -hmm. and so there was, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, the senator from, Rapid City, the extension agent. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, can't even think of his name. And yeah, I'm the guy thinking, who lost his family yeah, in, the, in the flood. Rapid City flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But tremendous individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I worked with him close, uh, lobbying. Uh, he was a guy that carried very little legislation mm -hmm. but he guided most of it yeah uh he drafted an awful lot of legislation uh he was a, a real force on the uh the appropriations committee for mm -hmm. years uh but there would be legislation coming in from various legislators that 
he had drafted, uh, put together, and encouraged the guys to. to but uh, a just he had a phenomenal mind uh, as far as the way the legislature worked and mm -hmm. how to work the legislature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned an awful lot from him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You were also involved in uh, starting the uh, ag business program up at Votech in Watertown. Do you want to talk about yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, they, uh, uh, one of the instructors up there uh, come to me and uh, said he would like to teach some ag business mm -hmm. programs. But what he would like to do was, was get some business participation. He wanted to do three months of classroom, three months on the job, and mm -hmm. back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I helped set up then, number one, the program. And then I went out and got co-ops to participate in the programs. Yeah. And, uh, and as it turned out, an awful lot of these kids went went to work for the co-ops that they actually apprenticed in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it brought us a lot of... Uh... Yeah, hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, what do you got? Uh, let me give you a call about uh, one o'clock. I'm kind of tied up right now, but I'll hook it up. <laughs> we need a little musical interview. Yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He he's got a combine head. That's John Deere. They, yeah. they got a combine head to pick up in Jamestown, take to Morristown, and <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> then something on down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but. Uh, we were talking about the Votech. Oh, the Votech thing, thing. yeah. And I that program uh, really developed mm -hmm. uh, with the Watertown yeah. uh, deal, and uh, many, many, many of those guy kids went to work in cooperatives because I think we was a big uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, gainer in that program because uh, we did uh, develop quite a little mm -hmm. talent. Sure. As you look back over at, you know, for 30 years or so span here in South Dakota and then some additional time down in Kansas, what are the biggest changes you see in the kind of issues facing cooperatives? Um, you know, certainly we've seen some difficulties perhaps for some of the larger regionals over the years that, uh, that didn't appear 30 or 35, 40 years ago. Well, uh... There's a, there's a number of things. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the things I saw as, as you develop and you get bigger, and this happens in a lot of things, uh, you outgrow your management talent. And mm -hmm. I think that happened in some cases. Yeah. Uh, uh, they expanded and got bigger than than the management was growing, and of course, <clears throat> uh, the farm units as they got bigger and more involved and uh, concerned with running a larger operation, uh, I think their vision of the cooperative structure uh, they lost kind of touch with uh, with that so mm -hmm. so you didn't we lost loyalty yeah i think among the co-op membership mm -hmm. uh and yet uh yet i felt like the need was there just as strong or stronger than it ever been yeah. if they would cohesively stay together and work their plan mm -hmm. and uh, be willing to support the kind of management they needed. Uh, we, because of the need for getting larger and more volume in order to support the functions, uh, we put an awful lot of co-ops together that uh, 
didn't have the management growth to to take over the larger unit, mm -hmm. and uh, so that got us in trouble, mm -hmm. I think, to a certain extent. Yeah, and uh, so, but uh, in my view, the need is just just as strong there today as it ever was, and uh, it it may even have to recycle. And in some cases it has, but mm -hmm. in a little different form. Yeah. Uh, uh, particularly, actually there's more zeal in the cooperative movement in the value added aspect mm -hmm. than in the, the and we kind of lost it out of the marketing and, and the retail. Yeah. Yeah. End of it, uh, you know. You can you can look at the uh, soybean association, and uh, uh, it was kind of interesting because the main driving force and chairman of that uh, organization was an apprentice to ag unity in the legislative process as a young man, mm -hmm. and uh, so, uh, but uh, you know that's. Uh, you know, I think you've got a more cohesive understanding among those value-added people, you see, in what mm -hmm. can happen. Uh, and we've kind of lost some of that zeal in, in some of the traditional cooperatives. Yeah. Was what happened to farmland industries, you're originally from Kansas, was that pretty painful for you to see them go on? Oh, the terribly, way they did? terribly painful because I saw all the good things that came out of that program. Mm -hmm. uh, they pioneered in a, in a lot of the refinery and in the fertilizer, and uh, which was such a benefit to agriculture. And, uh, you know, I recognize some joint ventures with uh, private industry, but uh, uh, they just, I think they plunged into some fields that they just didn't have the expertise to, uh, to mm -hmm. follow up, you know. And uh, uh, that was uh, very painful to me. Uh, yeah. And in fact, oh, the one good thing uh, that come out of it, of course, uh, what I mean was they developed a retirement program that was second to none for mm -hmm. both the the members and for their own employees. Mm -hmm. But they early on isolated that totally from the company. And uh, I draw my retirement check from them yet today. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, they took they took that totally away from from the corporation and uh, yeah. Uh, otherwise, there would be man. That would be a total disaster for an awful lot of people because mm -hmm. uh, that's that's was a very successful program yeah. for them. And yeah. uh, so, but yeah, I uh, I had an awful lot of good friends uh, within that company. Uh, back to even uh, I knew the originators mm -hmm. and uh, Howard Cowden. Uh, you know, uh, I I remember one time they always told this story. Uh, they uh, somebody went down there. They had uh, all they was doing was taking oil tankers in and putting it in fifty five gallon drums and shipping it out to that of six original co ops that started them. You know, mm -hmm. and Somebody come down on the dock there, and they had a guy working down there was was filling these barrels and stuff, and they asked where Howard was, you know. Said, oh, I don't know. He's running around over South Dakota or North Dakota or Nebraska someplace trying to drum up our business, and he said, anybody can see we got more business now than we can take care of. <laughs> so that was always kind of a... A demonstration of the vision of the two men. Yeah. You see, uh, there was just a kind of a hand to mouth little operation getting started that that later developed into a multi billionaire, billion dollar company, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but you had a guy on the dock that thought they was already <laughs> overextended. <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, that was, uh, 
that was sad to see that uh, develop that way because yeah. Of, yeah did you think they could be they could have been saved you know or did you pay that much attention to it well I know there are some people that think there since they were able to pay off the debentures that they that they might have reorganized yeah i i think they could have i think they could have under the proper uh, management uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's sad i uh, you know i was involved in a creamery over on uh, here in south dakota one time that uh, was foreclosed on mm -hmm. and uh, when it was all liquidated there was more assets and and cash uh, about twice what the the de indebtedness was, yeah. and it was kind of a crying shame that it was taken over that way. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah I think uh, I don't know why it uh, it developed. See, I lost touch with that because most of the downfall happened about the time I retired. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you lose your contacts yes. and your yep. so so I wasn't uh, privy to an awful lot of the the things that happened right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I you know I can't help but believe that mm -hmm. uh, they could have come out of that thing if under yeah under proper. Uh, proper management. How many times have some of the uh, airlines gone bankrupt and come out again? Yeah. yeah. Um, what year did you retire now? What was it? Well, I retired in 97. Mm -hmm. Spring mm -hmm. spring of 97. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when January rolls around these days, do you ever miss going out to pier? Uh, you know, I thought, I really thought I would. Mm -hmm. And uh, the surprising thing is that I haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons that's true, I loved every minute of it, and lobbying was a real challenge to me. Mm -hmm. But lobbying is a year-round activity. Mm -hmm. And I, if I couldn't be on top of all the things that leads up to where you're at, mm -hmm. uh, then to me you're lost. Yeah. But for me to walk into pier in January without all the things that leads up to that legislative mm -hmm. session, uh, that would be interesting to a lot of people, but it'd be frustrating to me. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. because you see this piece of legislation, that piece of legislation, mm -hmm. and to the general public there's a whole story back here of why mm -hmm. it's here. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't, I, I'm not very comfortable if I don't have all the facts leading okay, up to that. Okay, not unlike farming. you got to plant the crop first before yeah. you can harvest it. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, I, you know, and I'm working with some mm -hmm. groups now. I, uh, you know, the Soil Conservation Service. Okay. And uh, they're they're in a real struggle for funding money, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, I've tried to help them a little bit, but it's frustrating because uh, uh, here a couple of years ago even, and, and they've been struggling for a couple of years, but a couple of years ago, you know, they kind of come in in December, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, <laughs> You know, that education process has to start at least yeah. a year ahead of time. Yeah. Because you can't walk in there in December with a plan and and mm -hmm. get people to accept that. You've got to do a lot of groundwork. Well, uh, this year they've been doing a lot of that. And, and the problem is they're funding uh, uh, hinges on some some people that's not willing to give up. Uh, and, uh, so, but they have met with, I, you know, I said, mm -hmm. Hey, those people are going to pose this. So you've got to meet with those people mm -hmm. and you've got to work out your differences. Yep. And so, uh, so I think they're in a, a year long process now of coming up with some things mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. but that's what legislation's all about yeah. is, is education, uh, 
You know, I uh, trust and integrity is paramount mm -hmm. in the uh, legislative of the process of, of lobbying. Uh, and anyone that doesn't think that that isn't true doesn't last long. Yeah. You know, and it's like I told my board when I first started lobbying. I told them that, you know, I'm going to tell those guys the truth if it hurts right down to the toenails. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only way we can build credibility. And uh, my first, and you mentioned at one time, is did you have opposition? Yeah. To cooperatives, and mm -hmm. the first two or three years, there was a lot of that legislation. Yeah. But what I worked on was education mm -hmm. with these legislators, and so my first three years was killing legislation that was anti-cooperative mm -hmm. legislation. From there on. I did most of my work the first two, the tense work, the first two weeks of the session because yeah. I had legislators coming to me saying, okay, here's what I want to do, J.D. Mm -hmm. How's this going to impact your people? Yeah. And I was able to help them with amendments and changes mm -hmm. to legislation before it was ever introduced that would have been, I'd had to been opposed to had I let them introduce it the way it was. So I was able to stop a lot of legislation before it was ever introduced or get it corrected mm -hmm. to where we could live with it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but that trust and those legislators mm -hmm. coming to you and say, here's a bill I want to introduce, but I want you to look at it first, mm -hmm. uh, saves you an awful lot of lobbying headaches mm -hmm. later on. In yeah, you kind of appreciate not being out there these days with term limits, so you'd have to be continually doing this education thing that maybe in the past you had more continuity? Yeah, there's, there's two things, two things that uh, would be... And I'm, I, I, it got worse, but it was starting to get frustrating the last year or two I was out there. Yeah. And that is uh, legislators who, I, I, you know, I guess I don't know how to say it, but that I, when I was lobbying, uh, the bulk of the legislators, you knew where they stood. When yeah. they told you something, that was gospel, mm -hmm. and you could depend on it. You could go to the bank with whatever they told you, and you intended to do the same thing to them. Mm -hmm. And you had that uh, report. You may yeah. disagree totally, mm -hmm. but I. But if I knew where he was at, yeah. and you could depend that's where he was going to be, mm -hmm. then you could live with that. Mm -hmm. See, uh, there's too many legislators uh, in the last couple of years I was out there that would tell you anything, and yeah. 20 minutes later they was doing 180, yeah. and that's frustrating. Yeah. To I think it's frustrating to conscientious legislators mm -hmm. as well as lobbyists, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that has become more prevalent since I yeah. left there, and that would be terribly frustrating to me to deal mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. because. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had <clears throat> I had a lot of people who maybe didn't agree with me. Yeah. But if I knew where they was at and they knew where I was at, mm -hmm. uh, we had a good rapport between us, regardless. Yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned the soil conservation folks. What else are you doing with your time these days? <laughs> you know, you you got a little more time. You're you've always been interested in uh, horses and well, uh, horses buggies and, and buggies kind of and, and still doing uh, yeah, that. Yeah, I developed. A, I started restoring buggies uh, 30 some years ago. Yeah. And one of the hurdles with restoring buggies was the wheels, mm -hmm. rebuilding the wheels. So I used to haul wheels down to the Amish country in Iowa. And sometimes I'd take two or three sets and stay there and build a set while I was down there. And then so I could bring them home. And because they was usually running six months to a year behind. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so one time when I was down there, why uh, the wheelwright I was working with down there said, J.D., you ought to do this, get the tools and do this yourself. Because mm -hmm. he said, I turn down more work from your country than I can do. 
And that was hard for me to believe. But anyway, I come home and it took about a year to round up the tools I needed. And what I couldn't find, I had some machinist make, mm -hmm. designed and make for me. So I started doing my wheels. Well, then I had people looking over my shoulder saying, would you do me a set? set for me, you know. And uh, so it wasn't but about uh, two years that I had all the spare time taken up uh, building wheels, and I quit restoration. I haven't done any restoration now in mm. 25 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, I did. And now, I, of course, I've slowed down. I, when I retired, uh, I was doing a lot of wheel work and, mm -hmm. and uh, thought I'd get back at some restoration because I think I've got three buggies out there to be restored yet. Okay. And, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, working out there by yourself all day long, when you had traveled all your life and mm -hmm. visited with farmers and watched the crops grow mm -hmm. and stuff like this, uh, I missed that. Yeah. And so... Uh, the John Deere dealership called me mm -hmm. one time uh, and wanted to know if I'd deliver some machinery for them. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sounded interesting. And so I guess I've, I've helped them for six years on a part-time basis. Okay. It gets me to the country. I watch the crops develop and grow, and, and I get to talk to some farmers and, and visit with some people. And... When I was working full time, I could go out to my shop and it didn't make any difference whether I pounded on the anvil or what not. Mm -hmm. It it was good therapy. Yeah, something See, different. And I was away from the phone. But to take it for full time uh was not my cup of tea. Yeah. So I still do some work but I enjoy uh I enjoy get traveling and getting out in the country mm -hmm. and visiting with farmers. Okay. So uh, as you uh, look to the future, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Oh, I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely an optimist. Always have been. I, uh, I've i always looked at everything as a challenge. Yep. And there was a way to get it done mm -hmm. if it needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm not uh, one to easily give up on anything. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm very optimistic. Okay. We've been visiting with J.D. Lind. Thank you for your participation in the Cooperative Legacy Project, J.D. Uh, good luck to you. It's been a good trip. I've enjoyed uh, every minute of it. Thank you. <laughs>